Okay, so 9th of July. Um, thanks for coming along, everybody. And I've shared the meeting link in the um, in the chat window. Um, we've just got a few things to talk about today, I think, um, uh, which will be you know any recent data. And then I wanted to just make a couple of comments about uh, solubility and accumulation assays. But we can do that after we've talked about any new data. Yu Heng has already uh, posted an update of some of the compounds that he's been making, which is really good. So that's helping him complete his set of molecules that we would like to publish. And, and I think some of the um, enzyme inhibition data from those molecules, the, the previous set, um, it, are the ones that, Adrian, you've been looking at most recently. So yeah. if it's okay, <clears throat> you, could we start with the deck that I think you sent through just before the meeting and we can post later? But if you're happy to go through that, that would be very... Very good. So, so I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Okay, can we all see that? Yes. All right. So, um, essentially, if you could the, screen, that would be even better if you could make it full. Uh, I can do that. Perfect. Uh, okay. Right. So what we're going to talk about are the um, extension of the assays that we've been carrying out on the parazoliprimidine class of compounds that were originally identified by AZ and have been studied by Yuhang as principally targets for mercy inhibition. Um, but there has been a question as to whether these molecules will multi-target the other myrlide gases uh, by virtue of their propensity to bind to the ATP binding sites. <clears throat> so um, we've generated in the past some single digit, single concentration data, which suggests that they do. Um, but we really need a bit more detail in terms of the relationship between inhibition and concentration for Mercy, D, E, and F. And this really is what this presentation is about. So <clears throat> just for information for those who want to check, check later, uh, here are the assay conditions we've used. The main thing to say about this is that we're using subsaturated concentrations, <clears throat> excuse me, at the ATP substrate, let's have a drink. Make it up, <clears throat> and uh, we're using um, a concentration range of <clears throat> the uh, test compounds between 0 0.049 in certain circumstances up to two millimolar, so 0 0.049 micromolar to two millimolar, and we've kept the enzyme concentration low below <clears throat> 15 nanomolar in all cases. So um, the, this is what the data is going to look like. So what you have are six graphs. They relate um, compound concentration to inhibition. The red uh, data are inhibition of MERS-E. Uh, blue data, <clears throat> inhibition of MERS-E. Uh, green data, inhibition of MERS-D. Purple data, inhibition of MERS-F. <clears throat> And what you can see is a massive shift in IC50. Uh, if you uh, try to inhibit enzymes other than Mercy, so so Mercy has a particularly high affinity for these compounds. The other myelin ligases <clears throat> are characterized by a much much weaker affinity. Um, now we've so far we've assayed six compounds we were sent in February. Um, <clears throat> one of which is the original AZ compound, AZ5595. And we've carried that through to a more later data set where <clears throat> Hugh Hang introduced an amine onto uh, one end of the molecule to improve permeation into uh, bacteria. Um, and that also has a very significant impact not only on Mercy, but it really doesn't improve things for the other ligases as well. 
So what we're looking at basically are a class of molecules that really potently target mercy, but really have a fairly negligible impact upon the other mole ligases. Um, the constants that you derive from this are in, are in this table. Um, if I can just draw your attention to the Ki values for each ligase. So with mercy, <clears throat> for this compound class, we have Ki values from 88, 89 nanomolar down to around about 18,000, so 18 micromolar. However, with mer D, mer E, and mer F, those Ki values are heightened by at least two to four orders of magnitude. So if you basically look at that schematically, um, the red bars are the Ki values for inhibition of mercy, assuming competitive binding with respect to ATP. And you can see a gradual increase in the um, detectable uh, Ki as uh, the structure changes from 25,5p down to 88xp. However, for virtually all of these molecules, uh, D, E, and F have very, very much higher KIs, indicating a very, very much lower affinity. And in actual fact, only really at the weakest binding MERS-C inhibitor, which is 88XP, do the other ligase um, molecules become as sensitive as mer And that really is, is where we are with this. What I will do, I'll post the raw data on the website because the, it, it is not here in its entirety yet. Um, and um, any questions? Yeah, great. <clears throat> Anyone got any immediate queries? I've got a couple. Go on. Um, so what one is the, the uh, age-old question of... The potency of 5595 and the fact that we've, I mean, it's obviously doing well in this assay. The potency, the IC50 that's measured against Mercy is obviously still higher than originally reported. I know you're always quite relaxed about this because of the difference in the assays and you're, you're still relaxed about that. The fact that different assays give different IC50s here. Um, as long as we get the same relative change and as long as ballpark we're in the same sort of area. Yeah. Which I think we do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think we do because the yeah the top left molecule five hundred five is better. The second one, if you could just go back to uh, slide three, is it number three, just that one above? So, um, the, uh, it's the, I think it's the is it this one the, on the bottom right? There is one of the guanidinium compounds. Um, which That's is giving, right. the, I guess, the best 76 there is giving, you know, I, I mean, a measurable IC50, I mean, you know, a couple of hundred nanomolar IC50 for one of the guanidinium compounds, um, which I think is the best result we've got so far for one of the compounds that's been modified in that way, as far as I remember. So, that one, I mean, plus, plus the, obviously the top left are the most potent compound, but that one with the guanidinium, which is giving us something, would definitely be one to try and get an MIC for. Yeah. Because the point about that modification is that it's meant to help the compound accumulate. It also had a very good KI. Oh, uh, did it? Um, well, I mean, 76. Um, gives us a KI of. Oh, I've written it down wrong, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like I say, you can, I, I can send this round and you can study the study post talk, but it's, the KI is around about three and a half micromolar for that particular compound. The IC50 is around about uh, 4.7 micromolar. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. Of the first set of compounds we tried, it was actually. Um, the worst. In actual fact, introduction of a positive group does in general seem to do that on that region of the molecule. I hasten to add. Okay. So, yeah, maybe I've got the wrong one in that case. So, do you, do you mind going to slide six? Sure.
Uh, yeah, I think, I think I confused myself on here. Yeah, all good. All right. Okay. Shall I go back to slide three? Yeah, I show you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's it's giving something, not not nothing tremendous, but it's giving something. It would be the, the logical one to try of the ones that have been modified. Yeah, I mean, to put it in some form of context, d serine has a single digit MIC for um, E. coli, and it's well, I've measured its IC50 for DDL before, and it's around about 8 micromole. So, if if there is a possibility of it accumulating, then there is a possibility that it might actually work as an antimicrobial. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. But I mean, a very clear result in terms of the lack of multi-targeting. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that you could realistically expect, for example, if you've got a mutation in Mercy, which caused um, a loss of sensitivity to these compounds, I don't think there would be sufficient sensitivity in the remaining pathway uh, to really rescue that in mm. that microbial sense. Yeah. I mean, so so really, in reality, you you have a very nice collection of very nice Mercy inhibitors. Yeah. Um, but it is telling you that um, the binding sites are different enough for the other male ligases for it to be fairly discriminatory as well. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's useful data for um, the paper nonetheless. And you, Hang, you're going to have to try to, you know, include the data in the um, in the grid, the table you've got, and, and you know, re-clarify what we're missing for for the first publication. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions that anyone has on on these data? Okay, great. Thank you, Adrian. Welcome. Um, so I was gonna um so we have both Laura um and uh, and Scott on the call. So I was going to just come to any updates on any attempts to get uh, crystal structures. So Lara's been obviously playing with many compounds. And Scott, I think you were looking at this compound J06. I wondered if you had any updates. We don't have a structure with J06, but we're shipping some crystals um, actually tomorrow uh, and working on soaks right now. Uh, most recently, I was going to mention, um, we obtained crystals of the Pseudomonas Mirce in complex with one, it, well, it was co-crystallized with one of the compounds, F09. Um, not great diffraction, around three angstrom resolution, but we're just, we're not seeing the compound bound. Um, however, the ones that were just mentioned, if they're higher affinity, if you, um, if you want to send any of these compounds, we can certainly set those up with the near C. Um, they're crystallizing. Um, also, the Pseudomonas near D, uh, we also obtained some data for recently. Uh, again, around three angstrom diffraction with uh, M02 ligand. Uh, but we didn't see density for that. But um, yeah, any compounds that you want us to try, please feel free to send them. Yeah, I mean, I, the question, I guess, is, and, and others may have a better idea of this than I do, what, what compounds do we have that are new that, um, for which we don't have structures? You know, there's a list, right, of things that we do have. Is any, does anybody have a suggestion for something which we are, we're currently missing or, or, of the new set, perhaps? It's always I'll have to go and look at the data. Yeah, we can just look at the data and select the top compounds yeah. on Samsung. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, are you using the short construct of Pseudomonas Mercy or the full length? That I believe that is the short one that uh, Joe had suggested we use. Mm -hmm. Will yeah. you be trying the full length as well? Pardon me? Will you be trying the full length, full length construct? 
Yeah, I'll have to double check the construct that we have or constructs. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just it's, the truncated version is not actually going to be enzymatically active uh, because it is missing a chunk of the ATP binding site. Um, so, and there will be interactions there that probably we would otherwise miss. So, if it is at all possible to prioritize the full length native protein, that'd be great. Okay. Although I, I understand crystallographically, it's always been a little bit more tricky than the truncated variety. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check those constructs. Yeah, the only ligand we're seeing bind, as you probably know, is this A19, which is on the surface of the protein, kind of, uh, <laughs> it's sitting there wanting to get to the active site, as I say, um, and it's probably due to sulfate competition. So we're trying to, you know, any soaks with lower sulfate or no sulfate to see if that compound will get into the ATP pocket. So hopefully the crystals we have going tomorrow will pan out. Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So on our end, yeah, we haven't gotten any compound bound structures yet. As you saw, if not, you would have gotten an email with the structure. <laughs> uh, right, but I'm trying something different as well. So I went to the Japan uh, Leicester meeting um, collaboration. And it was all about crystallography and stratigraphy, um, and it was very inspiring. <laughs> I talked to a few people on CrowEM, and they all suggested we should give it a try. So I've got booked for the twenty second to try to test my grids on the cryos in Leicester, and I'm gonna be testing them and see what happens. I'm gonna try to make the complexes as well because the Miller gases. In theory, they should be forming these complexes, so we get a bigger molecule. But we're gonna try anyway the able proteins and see how far we get, and if there is any um, any per, um, possibilities of going through that route and trying to get a structure to the, that that route. Uh, we just need to get a blob of a compound that is good enough so we can dock in the the compound really um, in the correct orientation. And that will give us at least a little bit more information that not having any crystal structure, <laughs> um, basically. So I'm trying that. Uh, let's see what happens in the 20 second and if the sample looks okay. If not, I will reclone stuff in to make the protein bigger with a tagged protein uh, into the new ligase um, and go that route as well. It's just, I just want to try something new. At the same time, on August, I also have time for doing serial crystallography. So I'm trying to grow uh, microcrystals so I can try to include this sample as well. So I originally have this uh, um, time for the serial crystallography for a different project. But if I got new crystals for the new ligases, a tiny crystal that look OK, then I'm going to bring them. And if we have time, we're going to test them as well on the serial crystallography. And let's see in, if that way we can do soaks in the, in a time resolved manner and see if the problem is because they just go in and out really fast. We can also try room temperature, which could also be a problem um, in terms of uh, the binding of the compounds so once you freeze them, um, things like that. Uh, yeah, because uh, apparently uh, quite a few people in the meeting that I joined for stratigraphy had been seeing differences on the component of the binding when they were doing room temperature and freezing crystals, so, which I hadn't known that was an issue before, but they all discovered that issue when they were doing real-time crystallography. Mm. So it might be that that can solve the issue. Let, let's see how far I can get on that. Yeah. Very great. You mentioned so later this month in Leicester, did you say? Uh, sorry, Leicester, um, Liverpool. <laughs> So sorry, the meeting the meeting I went was in Liverpool. The samples for Carrier will be at Leicester. Leicester, right? So I just mix all the time the names. <laughs> <laughs> yes. City so have, so that week, yeah. After that, that week, it, obviously, if I got data collected, it would probably take me longer to know how well it went. But I can send an update to the team and just mention would we see the the proteins or not? Okay. All right. Great. And I mean, in terms of the um. 
uh, you know, which compounds to soak in, we we should have a think about which of the AZ series we don't have, for example, or or the kind of, I mean, if you're trying something out, whether you want to try a compound that we know should behave like 5595 or something. Yeah. But but beyond that, of course, you know, we're we're ultimately trying to find a a, a bound a, a crystal structure with with a bound compound from a different series that that has has potential for multi-targeting. So you know, some of the ones that have hit on the previous rounds um yeah. that derived from atomized compounds and things like that. I, I guess you know the what the compounds that Scott was just talking about have always been the sort of front runners, I suppose. Um and so if you get something from the cryo, you know, do, do you have a set of compounds from that series that you'll be happy to try? If yes, things... yes. I'm going to bring apoprotein and also with ligands as well. So right. I bring as many as I can, and then we'll see how many they make me do. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, I will see okay. how many samples I can get tested. Yeah. Great. Great. Because they could, these compounds could also be helping to get a better... Um, a better structure as well, because I'm guessing with the APO protein, I'm going to have different conformations of the protein, so that's going to uh, have an impact on the resolution anyway. Mm. So mm. I always wanted to test some of the compounds, and obviously A and PCP. <laughs> yeah. And let's see how far we can get on that. Yeah. Okay, great. We'll, we'll uh, wait to hear how it goes. Mm. I think it's good. All right. Thanks. All right, so... um. Just on a, a couple of things that came up to do with the compounds that we're looking at, particularly the ones that are not part of the AZ series. Um, we had a conversation last time about geese compounds um, and and some of the concentrations that we were having to use in the assays were quite high. And so uh, a question came up about um, solubility and the need to measure solubility of some of the compounds that we're using. Um, and we haven't really found a good solution to this yet. We, we've had our lab manager at UCL look around for potential places to, to do some kinetic solubility measurements to make sure that we're using compounds in the right kind of range. We don't have a good solution um, that is that is sort of affordable. There are lots of solutions that, that cost money, but nothing where we can sort of send you know 20 or 30 compounds um, and get something done inexpensively or perhaps as part of a, of a collaboration. Um, if anybody does have a solution to that, so a, a way of measuring kinetic solubility with some of the molecules, obviously on a small scale, because we're dealing with small amounts of sample, it would be great to hear that either now or later. Um, but uh, yeah, any, any ideas would be very useful. We are still searching, but uh, it's not something which we have found a good solution for. Um, and related to that on the accumulation assay, so how we can determine which molecules are getting in and how well they are getting in there. I've been in touch with um, Paul Hergenrother, uh, who has put me in touch with the group that does the work for um, in his papers. Uh, so I just need to get in touch with them and, and ask how it works. It turns out it's a group at, um, at a facility at Duke. Um, and so I'll see if we can get some compounds measured in that. Um, uh, but again, if there are other potential solutions then uh, please let me know if we have anybody who might be able to measure the accumulation of molecules in bacteria. All right. Um, okay, so uh, that were the those are the, the the sort of two things I wanted to mention. Um, and uh, and you know, you hang and, and Guy are continuing to make molecules. I don't think there's any big chemistry update there, and we can we can maybe wait until next time. But um, I saw the uh, Northeastern team were on the call. Did anybody from there want to update on any developments in terms of finishing off synthesis or shipping compounds? Yeah. Um... I think Cole has a couple of slides um, that he's going to present. They're already on the issue, Matt, before you oh, ask. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'm going to get better at that. Okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Cole. I'm an undergraduate. Hi. I started in June. Um, I'll share my screen now. Uh, if that works. Uh, issues with it's not allowing me to share it. I just have to update my system preferences. Uh -huh. 
now that new operating system. Do you want system. me to share it? Because I have it open. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, please hold. Oh, off. All right, you're up, Cole. Thank you. Um, so yeah, as you guys know, the molecules on the left, the M08 and the M17, are the ones that we started with. So I've just been working to make some analogs of those. The general scaffold on the right is the same as the ones on the left, and that's uh, what I've been working with, substituting the R group for the an aniline thiophenol, four chlorothiophenol, and then uh, R2, amino to phenol ethanol. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So it's been a two-step uh, mechanism with step one, getting this uh, desired starting product with the amine group at the bottom. At first, we were doing this with dioxane and HCl, which would give us an impurity with an alcohol group attached. So we switched that process using anhydrous for molar HCl in dioxane, and that got rid of that, uh, giving us like over 95% pure of the desired, the desired starting product. Uh, so I started just attaching aniline um, just to see if the mechanism would be successful. Um, and it worked out very nicely. So we uh, made this compound, the CNI003, which um, worked out well, and then went on to make the CNI004, which um, we decided to do after reading this paper. Um, and then the CNI008 was just to match with the aniline, and the CNI012 was with the parachloro, which we have, I believe Olivia made one with a, a amine parachloro. Um, and so that was just to have the S there rather than the nitrogen. Next slide. So the, the next steps are to then try to attach oxazole because that would use a five member ring rather than the six member ring, which we've been adding. And then we also have a, uh, a match of the one below with sulfur. And so this was just to get one with uh, nitrogen there. And then also I'm starting to make a, a phenol attachment, which then we would have uh, one with the nitrogen, sulfur and oxygen attached to the benzene ring. And then the last slide is just the compounds we'll be sending in the next shipment. So two of Tommy's compounds, the TWC1037 was the same as from the paper as CNI004, just that had the, uh, the, hex, the cyclohexyl ring. And then the TWC1029 was just with the aniline attached to his same starting scaffold. And that's everything. That's great. Fantastic. Yeah, great progress. I guess he'll be shipping those pretty soon by the looks of it. Yeah. That's great. I bet you were really popular in lab using thiophenol. I bet you have a lot of friends. Oh, yeah, that was that was tough. Definitely a struggle <laughs> at the start. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, all right. I think so that is I think that's everything I had on the agenda, everything else. Um, on on the on the GitHub, you can kind of sit there for for a bit. But those are the main things. Did I miss anything? Anyone wants to raise? Um, because I think it's important that we, um, as a group, stay in touch with uh, Scott and with Laura about molecules that we should be using for soaks in case we strategically want other compounds doing. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it remains the, the big thing is trying to get a structure with a non-AZ compound. Um, that, that still is the most important thing. So let's be in touch about that. Um, and Scott, if you need any advice about stuff, you've got capacity. Uh, and if we don't reply, then then please stay in touch, you know, in case we can do something like that. But thanks for trying. Will do.
yeah, fingers crossed on the crystals. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I hope they work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think that's everything in that case. Um, our next meeting is sometime in the middle of August. Um, we can make a call nearer the time about whether we go through with that. I think a, a bunch of us may be on holiday. Um, certainly us Europeans tend to disappear for August. So we can we can uh, think about that like a week before the meeting and, and cancel it if, if too many people are away. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks very much for coming along, everybody. And thanks for sharing. And hopefully see you soon. Yeah. Thanks very Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.